Welcome, my name is Claudio Draghia. I come from Bucharest, Romania. It's my third time here in Kiev. Today I will talk to you about how managing a team is not managing horses. It's a catchy name, I really like it, and it highlights a couple of aspects. So, you know, it's customary to say a couple of things about yourself at the beginning. So I worked as quality manager for Capgemini for the past eight years. And I say I work because since December I'm on parental leave up until next year in November. So I'm pretty free and open. I'm also part of the testing community back in Romania. It's called Tabra de Testare. Translated into English, it's testing camp. And I have my own projects that you can find on brainforit.com. So first of all, why the title? Because if you didn't know, management, the etymology of the world, comes from managing horses. Apparently, back there in the Middle Ages, managing a horse was an elaborate activity. You had to take care of the horse, you had to wash it, feed it, make sure it had enough food, make sure it had enough water. It was rather difficult. So we took this term up until the 21st century to describe how we can handle people. Okay? I really hate the word management. Who does it? Who hates it also? Yeah? Only a few people? Yeah. I've been working in IT for the past 13 years, and I can honestly say that I have only met two real managers. Only two. People that were actively engaged with you, that attended to your needs, they made themselves extremely well pleased in the team. Only two out of maybe, I don't know, a hundred or so. So what's the difference between a group and a team? Of course, there are a lot of debates about this term, but the thing that I want to highlight is that everybody is going after the team. Apparently, being part of a team, it's more efficient. There is a competitive advantage of belonging to a team, and everybody knows it. For instance, this is an ad, the first one on the left, from a coffee shop somewhere in Berlin. Welcome to our team. The one in the middle, if you can see here, there are some guinea pigs. It's from a pet store back in Romania. And it says something like, join our team. The one on the right is from a bread store that says, come and work in our team. Apparently, everybody wants to have a team. But nobody knows exactly how to do it. But it's catchy. It's really catchy. On a job website back in Romania, it's called eJobs. I searched for the term team, and there are almost 3,000 Results. Apparently, in Romania, there are around 3,000 teams, or at least 3,000 teams. It's a catchy word. How many times do you think the word team comes in the Scrum Guide? Any guesses? No. It's actually 102 times. And if you count also the term Scrum Team, it's 149. So apparently, having a team is a good thing, right? Do you like being part of a team? Yay! Okay, now, is the team important for testing? It's a hard question. Yes, of course, it is. you love it when you're part of a team. When you work together with people towards the same goal, you do the things that you love, and you get some gratitude for it. So, what did I do to understand teams better? In my last three years at Gemini, I was, was named or appointed the agile coach. And I had one important goal, to create a Scrum practice community with the Scrum Masters. So we had to learn more about Scrum, but I also had to learn more about teams. So what I did, I did a lot of research, read a lot of articles, gathered a lot of knowledge. Then the question came up, what should I do with all this knowledge? So I tried to put them in a visual shape. I tried lots of things up until I got to this wonderful layout. You can find it in aboutteams.braidforit.com. Now let's see if the movie works. Yes. So what's nice about it is that you can click on any area, you get some small sub-areas, and you get some information about it. Uh, you should not expect this to be a tutorial. It just links to articles that I considered relevant and useful in real life. Now, what will this talk be about? Especially 
about team effectiveness models and goals. Because they are, I believe, the bottom bricks, the thing that the team actually needs in order to exist. And when we talk about goals, we also talk about growth mindset and moving motivators. <coughs> Sorry. But before we go on, I have two warnings for you. The first of one is trying to acquire experience with theory is just like trying to satisfy your hunger by reading the menu. There are a lot of studies, a lot of nice things. Not everything works. You will have to try it. Sometimes you will fail. But when you try something, make sure that if it fails, you and your team will survive. It's extremely important. You know, nowadays everybody's talking about failure. It's important to fail, but it's also important to learn from your failures. And before you do it, make sure it's survivable. Make sure you can live afterwards. The second warning comes from a guy called Gert Hofstede. I don't know if you heard about him. He worked at IBM in the 70s. And uh, at that time, IBM was a real company. And he noticed that there are different patterns about how people are working in different countries. And he defined a set of, he called them indexes or cultural dimensions. One of them is called power distance. And uh, it goes something like the degree to which the less powerful members of a society accept and expect that power is distributed unequally. Let's see how it looks for Romania. Pretty high, right? Let's see how it looks for Ukraine. Also pretty high. And for Germany, it's pretty low. There are huge differences, especially in the countries that were under communism and the Western world. Why do you think is that? Because we were taught to respect the people in charge. Even if you don't agree with them, you must go with the flow which is a huge downside in terms of working within a team. As a culture, for instance, in Romania, I believe that we're not used to working in a team. Because all your life, for the past 50 years before the revolution, you are told where to work, with whom to work, what to do, and what results to get. We are missing a lot of this team culture. Another cultural dimension is individualism the degree to which somebody is expected to act only in his best interest or his Im immediate family. Again, a huge difference between all the three countries. There are four more indices. We don't have enough time to go through them. But the point that I want to make here is that not everything fits. You have to tailor it to your culture. You have to look what's in it for your team, for the people that you're working for, with. The biggest challenge is when you have teams spread between different countries. That's the worst thing you can do. So next, we'll talk about team effectiveness. So team effectiveness models refer to the system of getting people to work together effectively and efficiently. It sounds pretty nice, right? There are around 10 models, or 10 models that I believe are worth mentioning. Some of them overlap, some of them are complementary. There are two that we will not talk about. This one, I believe, is the nicest one. Do you recognize it? Does somebody know what it is? It's a monster called Marty, and it comes from something called Management 3.0. It's something that a guy called Jurgen Apello came up with. And I will not talk about it, because if you search on YouTube, you'll have some wonderful presentation made by him about Management 3.0. Usually, they're entitled Management 3.0 in 50 or 60 minutes. So that one we will skip. But next, I will try to, sorry. I mentioned that some of the models overlap and are complementary. This is why I'm trying to build, let's say, a map right now to see if how they fit together, somehow to create a master model that would include everything. It's still work in progress. Now, I want to share with you five of the most important things that I learned from these models and how they helped me in helping the Scrum Master defining a team. So in order to get to the point of being a team, a group has to go through several stages. I'm sure you heard about Tuckman's stages like forming, storming, norming, and performing. They are quite familiar. There are a lot of models, like this one, that the state team goes through several stages, 
Some of them are useful because they give some indication about what to do to move to the next step or how to tackle certain challenges. But I find them useful in just knowing that the team has to go to several stages. There are certain activities that you should do, either if you're a team manager, team lead, or part of the team. The simplest models that you can tackle is the GRPI model, which says in a team you need, you need to have goals, you need to have roles, you need to have procedures, and you have to have inter interpersonal relationship. You need to define how people should communicate, talk, what are the expectations. It's the simplest model that you can always start with a team. The model also says that if there are issues, you can start from the bottom up. But there is one important aspect that many of the models forgive, is that people need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed. This guy is called Samuel Johnson. He looks pretty old, right? He said this in the 1700s, and it's true today. And also, people have to hear things seven times before they believe it. This guy is called Peter, uh, Patrick Lancioni, he's a great this consultant. And he constructed a model called the five dysfunctions of a team. And he says, if you're in a team, look for these five bad things. Absence of trust. There has to be trust between team members. Fear of conflict. A team is not something like flower power, everybody gets along. You need to have conflict constructive conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability, and last but not least, inattention to results. So you need to keep your ears out and eyes out for all sorts of issues and try to tackle them as best as you can. And there are certain behaviors and activities that need to be encouraged. I don't know if you know about this blog, Rework with Google.com. It's where Google publishes most of their research. And in their great wisdom, they had a project that tackled this, understand the team effectiveness. And what they come up with is five things that you need to tackle within a team. First one is psychological safety. Every team member needs to feel confident that no one in the team will embarrass or punish anyone else for admitting a mistake, asking a question, or offering an idea. It's the best thing that you can start a team with. And it's Google that's saying it. Okay? Next one is dependability. People have to be able to rely on each other. Structure and clarity. Remember the first model that we talked about? You had to have goals and roles. You need to have structure and clarity within the team. Meaning of work. It has to have a purpose. Why are you doing it? You have to know it. And last but not least, impact of work, which is fortunately the thing that we can show and tell the easiest since we're working in IT. Do you have any idea how you can show the impact of your work easily? By having some screens where you just pull up information from production. How many users are there? People using the things that you build or test. How many transactions there are done? Give, give the people back some information about what's going on in production and how their work impacts the product or the company. Last but not least, you need management support and coaching. This is stated in two models. The T7, that beside the team leader fit, also says that you need team support from the organization. The HACMA model that says supportive organization context and expert coaching. The bottom line is, what should you take from these models? Is that a team doesn't just happen. It's true, sometimes a team happens. A group of people can become a team without any actions from the outside or the inside. But in many situations, you need to take action. Either if you're just a team member, it's always up to you. Either if you're a team manager or team lead, you have to take action. You have to look at certain things how to avoid certain situations, how to encourage certain behaviors. A team doesn't just happen. You have to make it happen. Do you agree with me? Yes? Okay, so be committed. Next time, when you go back to your work, to your office, if you want to be part of a team, 
remember that it's also up to you. Don't expect from somebody from the above to make your group a team. And then we have a small conundrum. Introverts versus shy. This is Susan Cain. She's, let's say, a world-famous expert in introverts. And she defines introverts as most alive, most switched on, and most capable when in a quieter, more low-key environment, where shy people are people that fear social judgment. Now, taking into account that between 30 to 50 percent of people are introverts, how can you integrate them within a team? Do they work within a team? What do you think? From my experience, they are the best teammates. Why? Because we confuse terms. We believe that being part of a team means sitting together and doing the same thing, which is not right. Being part of a team is having a goal, a purpose, and we all individually have to contribute towards that goal. It doesn't matter if you're introvert or not. From what I learned, introverts make the best team leads because they will always give you the opportunity to do what you think is best. And also, there is something that Susan Cain mentions, the transcendent power of solitude. Sometimes, even if you belong to a team, you need to take some time off on your own. Just go somewhere, sit, think about what you do, and maybe you'll come up with a greater way of doing it. Being part of a team doesn't mean we have to do stuff together all the time. Next, I'm going to tackle a hard topic, goals. Usually when we talk about goals, we tend to separate them into two categories, company and personal related goals. But is there a clear line between these two? What do you think? Shouldn't be? Uh, last year, I believe, I told the dentist story. Do you remember it? Of course you don't. I love it. I want to tell it again. So imagine you go to the dentist, right? He does some work on one of your teeth and says, it costs you 10 euros, but you have to give me 50 because I need to buy a book and go to a seminar. Would you give him 10 or 50 euros? Five. You see, it's a difficult decision to make. You expect him to be trained, to know what he's doing, but somehow you're not willing to pay for that training. Right? Then why should your employer pay for all your trainings. Because you can leave the company and go somewhere else. The story was told, I heard it first from a guy called Alessandro Mancuso. He's a really, let's say, great developer. So if you have the time, just look him up at, uh, in, in Google, in YouTube, sorry. He's a great member of the craftsmanship movement. They took up the Agile Manifesto and made something more beautiful out of it. So the point that I want to make here is that there is no clear line and there should be no clear line between company goals and personal goals. A big difference between them is how you tackle them, how you engage in company goals, how you engage in your personal goals. So the best way that I found in dealing with company goals is OCR, Objective Key Results. They are extremely used at Google and they say, like, and they, the story goes like this. First, you need to have objectives, right? That have to be derived from company goals, but are also subject to negotiations between you and your company. You also have to state what you want to do. Next, they have to be defined quarterly or within a shorter period of time so that you are focused on them. Third, they have to be public. At Google, if you look somebody in the company directory, beside their email address, who's their boss, you'll also see what are their objectives. You can also search for other people's objectives. Why? To find out who else needs to do the same things that you do. If you need something from somebody else and they have totally different objective, you will not expect them to help you. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. How do you define your key result? Well, first of all, they have to be measurable. It's not just like, I will do better, and that's it. They have to make you a little bit uncomfortable. You have to stretch it out a little bit.
to put in some effort, some intention to reach it. And there has to be a public evaluation of results. So if you're a team manager or a team lead, make sure that your team members have OCRs. I found out that it's the best way to tackle self-development, to tackle company goals. But there is a downside. It takes a lot of time. Because it's not enough to go and just state the goals. You have to revisit them. You have to rediscuss them. You have to evaluate them. It's not like you set them up today and you come back after two months and say, how are you doing? It doesn't work like that. Sometimes you, maybe you need to change them even faster. Perhaps a person is moving from one team to another. You have to go in, step in and renegotiate the goals. So take into account that dealing with people from a team lead perspective takes a lot of time. Next, how can you tackle your personal goal? This guy is Dan O'Reilly and he has a very simple method. Break down your big goals into small daily tasks, schedule time to do those daily tasks and Enter your daily tasks in your calendar each day, just to remind you of the fact that you want to do something every day. This is Patrick Dobrowski. She has another approach. She says, draw your current reality, either if you like it or not. Then draw your future. Where do you want to go? And the most difficult part, try to find those steps that will get you there. It's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would reach their goals. Finding those steps is pretty difficult. And I would like to give you a couple of examples of my own. This is how the door in my living room looks like. I tried Dan O'Reilly's approach one time. I printed out sheets with every day, with my name there. I also put my wife's name there. And we tried to do stuff. It didn't work. For me, it didn't work. Perhaps it will work for you. This one is another example. Our daughter is eight months old, and she's starting to diversify, to eat solid foods. So in order to reach that goal, we made up a schedule. What we can give her, at which hour, what we should do. This thing worked. We are still in the process, but it works. It's somewhere in the kitchen, we raise it from time to time, we update it with what foods we have, we look out for it. So there are things that work and things that don't work. But the important fact is that you need to set a couple of goals. You need to drive yourself to where you want to go instead of just letting the water get you there. So if we're talking about goals, we need to talk also about moving motivators. What are the moving motivators. They are a great idea from Management 3.0. You remember Marty, the small monster? He also comes from Management 2.0. And what they have done is they have done some research and came up with 10 intrinsic motivators. If you search it on the web, you can even download them in an A4 format, print them, cut them out, and just play with them. But how can you play with them? So you take them and you start to arrange it by priority. On the left, you have the less meaningful ones. On the right, the ones that are important for you. It's very difficult to do. I have a couple of sets with me. So when I'll be in the speaker's corner, if you want to give it a go, I can help with it. So once you arrange them, they recommend that you do some stuff. But what I found works best is if you try to answer three simple questions. Does this influence my work in a good way? Okay. Or is this really important for me? If it is, what have I done about it? And the last one is, is there something I can improve? It's more of a way to start a talk with yourself to see if this is really what you wanted. Because knowing your values is pretty difficult. Does anybody in this room know what their really values are? Not taking into account the fact that they change over time. And in order to tackle this, what I've done with my team is took a scotch and just put them, glue them together. And every month or so, we would redo the exercise and see that there are big differences because your values depend on your context and might depend on how you feel on that day. 
there are certain values that will always tend to be on the right. And they might vary slightly. It doesn't matter. But there will be a set of values that will be definitely important for you. If we're talking about goals, again, we have to talk about the growth mindset. Have you heard about this term, growth mindset? It's highly used. And this is Carol Dreck. She's the most, let's say, foremost figure in what's called growth mindset. And she says that your goals will always reflect your mindset. But let's see, what's this, let's say, mindset talk? She defines the growth mindset and the fixed mindset based on how you tackle certain things. For instance, challenges. Either you avoid challenges or embrace challenges. Obstacles. You give up easily or you persist in the face of setbacks. Effort. You see effort as fruitless or worse, or you see effort as the path to mastery. It's very difficult to say. Criticism. You either ignore useful negative feedback or you learn from criticism. And since we're talking about feedback, I would like just to stop a little bit and talk to you about feedback. Usually we are used to this pattern, the sandwich or hamburger method, where you say something nice, then you give the real feedback, which is usually a bad feedback, then you say something nice again. It doesn't work. So in my search to find something better, I found this, the feedback wrap. Again, it's from Management 3.0. And what it says it should do, first you need to describe your context. Second, express your emotions. Don't just be angry. Let people know why you're angry. List your observations, sort them by value, and end with suggestions. Say what you expect will happen next. Now, let's see how this feedback looks in software testing. So, first of all, describe your context. I started testing on a build. Express your emotions. I feel we are not done yet with the functionality. List your observation. I have found several more bugs, and I have some questions. Sort them by value and end with suggestions. Perhaps you missed it, but I want to highlight you the most powerful statement here. We are not done yet. It implies that we still have time. We have to put in some effort. What I don't like about testers is that they complain a lot. Stop complaining that you have work to do. If you found a 100 bugs, it's OK. Don't complain that you find them. Don't complain that you have work. But state it to the team in such a way that you give them the chance to fix it, to work on it. So not yet has a huge power. Carol Drake mentions uh, an experiment done in a school where instead of grading the papers with F from failed, the teachers graded them with not yet. I guess you can assume what happened, right? People who got not yet actually improved. Because it gave them the chance or showed them the way that there is still time. You can still do it. So your mindset depends on how you look at challenges, obstacles, effort, criticism, and success of others. Always use the power of not yet, especially as a tester. With a grow mindset, intelligence can develop. Carol did a couple of studies, and uh, while she monitored the brains of people with fixed mindset and the brains for people with growth mindset, it's on fire. If you have a growth mindset, when you're dealing with prob problems, you get excited, you search for solution, your brain feels alive. Growing is a human need. Do you know this guy, Tony Robbins? He identifies that he says that people have six basic human needs. Certainty, uncertainty, significance, love and connection, grow and contribute beyond yourself. So growing is a need. We also tend to believe that in time, as we grow older, changes slow down, that we are no longer up to the challenge. I see that we are all here young people. What you need to know is that, in reality, 
we slow down a little bit, but not as much as we think. Dan Gilbert did a study, and he compared age groups with a predicted level of change. They, he just asked them, what do you think will change in the future? And afterwards, he asked them what has changed in the past. He found out that the actual level of change is not what we expect. If you look on this chart, when you're 18 years of age, the level of change that you predict will actually be the one around 50 years. So we do change. The question is, what do you want to change into? Why does this happen? Dan Gilbert says that it has probably to do with the ease of remembering versus the difficulty of imagining. More, in more simple words, we believe that this is it. This is the best that we have ever, that we will ever be. We will not get any better because this is it. It's very difficult to imagine how we will be in 10 years, 15, 20, even 30 years. It's challenging. But it's not so difficult if you set up your own goals. Where do you want to get? You tend, you start to see yourself in the future. So, we're uh, approaching the end. You haven't fallen asleep, right? No? So we talked about team effectiveness, about goals, introverts, growth mindset, moving motivators, feedback. Now, I want to leave you with some final words before the question and before we can talk in the speaker corners. You can contribute to your group becoming a team. It is up to you. Stop expecting that other people should do it. We just went briefly to these team effectiveness models, but you can go on the website or you can search on the internet also for applied examples, how people use those models in transforming their group into a team. What it took, what were their failures, and what were the benefits. Because if you want to grow into a team, expect sometimes to fail. But you need to try different things. Second, you need to set and reach your goals. It's important to have goals. For instance, why are you here today? Is it just because the company sent you? Is it because you want to become better professionals? Is it because you just like the company of other people? There are many reasons, but it's important to know it. Because knowing what are your goals also will make you live up to your expectations. Maybe sometimes you'll set higher goals that will be difficult to reach. Maybe sometimes you'll have lower goals that will be easier to reach. But at some point in time, if you start to work with goals, you'll find your way. And last but not least, make the team happen. If you want to be part of a team, always remember that it's up to you to make it a team. And only up to you. I hope you enjoyed this talk and uh, now it's time for questions. I'm sure there have to be some questions, right? Everything was so crystal clear, no challenges. We have here. Alexander Zaleski. Um, great talk, thanks. Thanks. A Thank lot. you. Um, two questions. First one: um, Do you have you observed in your practice uh, some difference between um, teams ma made of out of millennials, for example, and more? mature people, that's one question. And second, more funny one, uh, what is your favorite act team activity to make team happen? You know, there are like paintballs, drinking, okay. cabinets. So, so let's get to the first question. So first of all, I don't believe that the concept of millennials applies everywhere. So for instance, in Romania, we're so hook up on technology and people have this, let's say, millennial behavior even at 40 or 50 years old. Somehow this, let's say, categorization of people, I believe it's true, but it's not true in every country. So there was a study about a guy that uh, I totally forgot his name. He said that millennials tend to believe that they're the only one looking for meaningful work, which is totally wrong. Every generation wants meaningful work. Their meaning 
goes in different ways. What I can say from the, let's say, the millennial things is that I see in young people a desire to move up the, how can I put it in a nice way? They don't have patience. They want to get higher without much learning and they undervaluate the practice. They don't see too much value in practice. And to answer your second question, the biggest activity that I like is the one that I actually build. I took two sets of remote control cars and instead of the joysticks, I replaced them with buttons. And every car can be driven by four people. So what I like the most is just get eight people in the same room, hand them out the buttons, and without talking, they have to go to a course with the cars. If you want to know more about cars, just go to my website. I have some pictures there on how I build it. Any other questions? Come on, I reserve so much time for the questions. Thank you for the lecture. And um, my question is practical. For example, there is a situation that the project uh, has been developed, for example, for a year, and then a skilled person joins the team, and it can make uh, occur that the team leader is younger and has less experience than uh, the new member. Do you have any advice how to behave in such a situation? It, first of all, it would be very bad from my side to, say, to give advice. I don't like to give advice. What I can say is that if the team leader no longer finds his place, he should leave. Remember, there were two models where we talked about uh, management support and support from the organization. If you really want to have a team, you can just make a team with a group of people. Sometimes people have to leave. I know it's the most difficult part that most to say to somebody, sorry, you have to go, you should not do it unless you have tried to reason with that person. But sometimes you have to understand that from a group or from a team, things evolve and you have to change. Sometimes you have to leave. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the answer. Okay. Any other questions? I believe we had one here in front. So my, my question uh, is uh, a bit from a, a different area. Uh, are those uh, principles uh, about managing the team uh, applied in the family? This is the first one. And uh, another one, um, I um, personally I find it difficult uh, when managing people uh, because it, it's quite hard to uh, distinguish those goals and to stay, you know, patient enough uh, and uh, strict at the same time, in order not to be too indulgent. Okay. So how to deal Just with Just to answer your first question, I have a question for you. Uh, let's imagine that you are married right now, you're at home, your husband wants to watch something on TV, you want to watch something on TV. It happens every day. You argue for the TV. What do you do? You buy another TV, right? Uh, you, you, you cannot argue not? all the time. You buy another TV. <laughs> well, this doesn't work in business. So I strongly believe that how you feel in your family is not actually the same thing how you should feel in your team. You have to struggle with each other. You have to reach that compromise that is good from technical perspective, from business perspective, financial perspective. And you cannot do that with family. It depends. I'm a good communicator, so <laughs> <laughs> it works for me. I, c I will persuade my husband to just, you know, to, per to give Perhaps you have a greater power over him. <laughs> but if he were a different person, it might not work. So I believe that being part of a family and being part of a team are two different things and should not be mixed up. For instance, I have never seen, let's say, a successful business where people from the same family are employed there. Mm -hmm. They start to have arguments, they disagree, they stop talking to each other. I haven't seen it work. And your second question, sorry, uh, was about? How to uh, deal uh, with your personal goals and your uh, company goals? And uh, how to overcome that line when uh, you should be patient enough uh, to explain people they are on and at the same time to uh, 
to give the, the message <laughs> that uh, something should be done there? Uh, you know, it's, it's a very difficult question. I cannot answer it because it depends a lot on the context. It depends on the people that you're dealing with. If it's a younger person and they really, really, really want something, then you should expect them to leave if you cannot offer it. It depends a lot on the person, on the talks that you have with them, on the agreement that you have, and especially on the expectations that you set when you hire somebody. Because that matters the most. If you say, if you, within five years you can be promoted to a different position, and you don't live up to your word, then expect them to leave. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No? Then, thank you very much, and <laughs> if you want to have a go at the moving motivators or just want to talk about teams, I'll meet you up in 10 minutes at the speaker's corner. Thank you again.